All right, last week we talked about surveys and everything about collecting data for issuing a survey and a couple survey techniques that, that we saw um, last week. Uh, this week we'll talk about observational studies and experiments. Simulations aren't really uh, included in the textbook. There is, I think, one paragraph about simulations in the textbook. And a simulation, you, I had talked about it, you could do a driving simulator or a, a flight simulator if you're going to simulate flying an airplane. But we could do statistical simulations with, uh, with our table of random digits uh, doing a simulation. So that's a possibility as well. But I'm going to talk about observational study. So an observational study versus an experiment. In an observational study, you're going to um, either look at old data or you're going to um, create a, a sample of one population or one sample and then measure those that data afterwards. An experiment has a treatment group. An experiment has a treatment group. So that's on starting page 231. An observational study observes individuals and measures variables of interest but does not attempt to influence responses. So we just measure after the fact. Okay, something happens. Um, I want to measure GPA this year. Okay. The, the GPA of students, I think, is probably going to go down. We have a lot of F right now. So I think because of distance learning, GPA will be lower, right? Um, so this is not an experiment. An experiment, you impose a treatment to measure a response. So making everybody do distance learning, we don't have an experiment. Okay, we're not experimenting because we didn't divide you into some groups. So an observational study only looks at data of one group. So we take our all of our students at Santa Maria High School, look at their average GPA, and compare it to last year's GPA. That would be an observational study. Use old data to find statistical significance. Um, sometimes you have to do, use, do observational studies. There's no choice. Like in distance learning right now, we don't know well. We don't know um, what the outcomes are going to be, um, and it would be it would be difficult to say we're going to have a distance learning group and a control group and compare their GPAs. Could be done in college. I mean, in some colleges right now, they have they have distance learning and in class learning going on um, across the United States. So you could you could be in one of two groups: a distance learning group. You can be in an in-class learning group or a mix. You could be both. You could be distance learning and in-classroom and determine what the GPAs are for all those three groups. So that would be more of an experiment type setup. Um, but then again, you're not randomly assigning people to the groups. People are choosing to join those groups. So people that do distance learning are probably more likely to do better than people that do not like to, to do distance learning, even though they would put into that group. Okay, so that's uh, the difference between an uh, observation and experiment. And sometimes observational studies are better, like with uh, smoking and cancer. We know that smoking causes cancer, but we're not going to do an experiment to determine that. An experiment would be I put random people, random, let's say, teenagers into a treatment group. I want to make them smoke for the next 40 years. And then random people into a control group and make and make them not smoke, okay, for the next 40 years. And then 40 years later, see if who gets cancer. Okay, that would be unethical. Um, in 4.3, we'll study ethics of doing experiments and how to set experiments up in certain ways. But uh, so, like crashing a car, we, we're not going to test cars with people in them. So doing an experiment on, on that would be... Uh, bad, and there's a there's a TV program called MythBusters. MythBusters they actually do experiments and they study whether or not things work. Like 
um, using your cell phone at the gas station. If you use your cell phone at the gas station, what is um, the probability of blowing up the gas station? You know, there's that little sign, do not use your cell phone. Um, so MythBuster studied that and determined whether or not you could blow up a gas station with the cell phone. So some data collection techniques are better than others. We have surveying, we have observational studies, and we have experiments. If I'm going to do a survey, I'm going to take a simple random sample of people and determine uh, what their favorite pizza place is. I would want to go out and randomly select people and ask them, what is your favorite pizza place? Okay. A voluntary response sample is not great. Uh, the Santa Maria Sun does this every year. They say the best of Santa Maria. And they try to determine what the best place is in the city by taking a voluntary response sample, the people that get the most votes, the most popular places, usually win the best of. Um, so doing a survey is probably not the best method of collecting data. An observational study might be better. So an observational study, you're going to go out and get data from each pizza place. And from that data, you're going to determine what everyone's favorite pizza place is. Whoever has the most sales, probably. But that's still a confounding variable because, you know, most a lot of people might say Domino's Pizza or Domino's Pizza might have the best sales. Well, they have the most advertising. They're the most well-known pizza place around. And they usually, corporations, corporate uh, restaurants usually do better than um, small town family restaurants. How would you set up an experiment? So in an experiment, we would have to have a control and a treatment group or maybe multiple treatments. So we're going to give uh, pizza to people and let them taste all these different pizzas and determine which one's the best. Um, so that would be another way to set up an experiment, have many treatments and have taste testing. You've heard of a, like a chili cook-off or something like that where you're going to determine which pizza is the best. So I would say observational study would be best for determining what pizza place is the best. Um, washing your hands. Again, survey, observational study, or experiment. Do you wash your hands after using the restroom? So survey, everybody would say, yes, I wash my hands. So your data would be biased. Uh, your, your statistics that you get at the end of the study would be biased. So we don't want to use... Um, we don't want to use a survey to determine if you wash your hands. What about an observational study? That might be best. We want to observe people not going to the restroom, but observe people going into the bathroom. Maybe listen if the water turns on after they use the restroom um, to determine whether or not people wash their hands. And that would be helpful in making a decision about what percent it would be. Um, an experiment. Uh, again, you're going to have some kind of treatment imposed. Maybe people go out into uh, in, into places of work and set up uh, situations like they would on MythBusters to determine whether or not people wash their hands after using the restroom. Um, so this is a study done on class size, and it was using an observational study. So effects of class size. Do smaller classes in elementary schools really help students in areas like standardized tests, staying in school, and going to college? So students in small classes tend to have higher test scores. They tend to go to college more often. For example, St. Joseph High School, they got um, 400 students in their school. Santa Maria High School, we got almost 3,000 students in our school. So are you more likely to go to college out of St. Joe's? Well, a lot of people believe that. So I'm going to send my kid to St. Joseph High School. Well, you're just as likely to go to college out of San Maria as you would at St. Joe's. Uh, what is the confounding variable? Well, people that live or go to St. Joseph High School, they probably have wealthier families. Most of their families probably went to college, unlike our families, right? A lot of us, I'm, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, a lot of us that go to public school, 
we don't have the benefits that those have in private school or in wealthy communities. So that's a confounding variable. It's impossible to isolate the effects of small class size when you do an observational study. Um, unless you take a school in the city and like uh, let's take a school right here, Ontiveros uh, School or a Fairlawn School, right, the little elementary school, and we're going to do an experiment. We have to determine or set up small classes inside the school, maybe 10 to 12 students, um, and then have them the same class for four years with one teacher or maybe one teacher and an aide and determine did that help them uh, go to college. So this is similar to surveys. Uh, the book starts off how to experiment poorly. Um, or they use the word badly. It's on page 235. So one thing we could do is take one group and look at the results. Or take multiple groups and look at the results. So if we take one group, that's like looking at the AP test scores for everyone in AP class this year. I think that AP test scores are probably going to be lower this year than they were in years past. And, and why is that? Because everybody's doing distance learning right now. So you can make a cause and effect scenario, right? The online learning caused the AP scores to lower. The AP test scores decreased. Okay? Um, well, there also the test is free. So did the free test cause AP test scores to lower? We don't know. Okay? So there's two variables there. One of them is online school. One of them is the test is free. Both of those variables affect AP test scores. And we don't know which one affected more. Okay, So that's just one group. In order to do a good experiment, I would need a control and a treatment group. So usually we take participants and we put them into a control group and a treatment group. So let's say we take uh, 100 students. And we're going to put 50 in the control group. And we're going to put 50 in the treatment group. So this is a diagram that kind of represents that. <coughs> um, so it, we take our students and we're going to divide you up. So if I'm going to do this online school thing, I would take 50 students and have them um, go to the control group and have 50 students go into the treatment group. You could also have a third group. Let's say we take, let's take more students. Let's do, let's apply another treatment. So we could have multiple treatments, like one group is gonna get free AP tests. Uh, this treatment is gonna get the free AP test. This treatment group, they're going to get online school. They're gonna take classes online. So we would take, okay, that would be more, I would say, now we got 150 students, and I would put 50 in each group. It doesn't have to be 50, it doesn't have to be 20, it could be as many people as you can get, and not it's not always going to be a whole number. Sometimes you might have 42 people that showed up to participate in the control group, and 32 that were in the treatment the free AP test, and then you have 25 that are taking school online. So we can have multiple groups uh, with different sample sizes, and most people that participate in studies, usually um, we want a simple random sample, that's randomly selecting people, but most of the time people that participate are going to be volunteers. People in experiments are volunteers usually. So the key in here is to randomly assign the volunteers into one of three groups. Okay, um, If we randomly assign 
then we have our um, have our definitions of a completely randomized design satisfied. Completely randomized means that you randomly assign people to different groups. So here's an, another example of an experiment. Um, the Tennessee Star Program did an experiment on class size. So they took the subjects of 6,385 students and put them into one of three treatments. So the three treatments were regular class with one teacher, regular class with teacher and full-time TA, and a small class. So they had students in small classes. And so those treatments are levels of a single factor. So in this, in this case, we had our, uh, our factor is um, type of class. Our treatments, we had three treatments. So our first treatment is small class size. Our second treatment is uh, just a regular class with one teacher. And we have another treatment we have, that could, a regular class could be thought of as a control group, right? If you just have regular school, that's like a control group. And then we have a regular teacher with a TA. So we think teacher with TA might help students grades. So that's the difference. Uh, the factor tells us what the treatment is and the treatments are what you actually impose. Okay. So the factor could be th thought of as the treatment that we're giving. We could have multiple treatments. The students stayed in the same type of class for four years, then all returned to regular classes. In later years, students from the small classes had higher test scores, were less likely to fail, and had better high school grades. Okay, so that is um, a an experiment where they put students into different groups. As long as they were randomly assigned, then this experiment is called completely randomized. A completely randomized experiment is... Um, when you randomly assign to different groups. So conducting an experiment, how would you conduct an experiment? Does listening to music while doing homework affect teenagers' productivity? So in that experiment, I would have to have randomly select students. Okay, we might have volunteers. Then I'm going to randomly assign them to the treatment group, which is listening to music and doing homework. And then you have a control group where people just do their homework. Um, and then look at their productivity after um, after they do studying for maybe five or six weeks or something like that. And a measurement of productivity could be a questionnaire. It could be uh, looking at grades. It could be looking at a test. Okay, if I give you a test, like we're going to take the chapter four test in a couple weeks. I'm going to have half my groups listen to music. And study and the other half not listen to music and compare those. The three principles of experimental design are treat, um, randomization and we'll talk about this uh, several times today. Randomization I'm putting it in the wrong spot. <laughs> Let me erase that. Completely randomized. So you got to have randomization for it to be completely randomized. So that means we're going to randomly assign subjects to different groups. The pre three principles of experimental design is randomization, replication, and control. Control means 
you must have a control and a treatment group. So you're controlling lurking variables because we want to establish cause and effect. Replication means you need large sample size. So I had 50 in each group. Um, if you have like five people in three different groups, that's not a very big sample size. So it's hard to apply your sample to uh, the entire population. So if you have a large sample size, you can apply your results to a larger population. Okay, if you randomly select people, if you randomly select people, then we can establish cause and effect. Um, so those things we'll talk about 4.3. Uh, what is the placebo effect? Placebo effect means uh, people think they're going to get better, therefore they will. Um, the placebo effect eliminates chance variation. So we, what we want to do is eliminate chance variation by having a placebo group. So if I'm giving medications, for example, COVID-19, I want to determine if medication works for COVID-19. So in this case, I would give a treatment like the, uh, I would give a, a medication, a prescription, prescription for uh, medication. It's going to be one group. And another group, I'm going to give a sugar pill. And they use sugar pills. And they make the pill look just like the original pill, like the true medication. So people are going to take this. And the reason why you would do that is because if you get sick, for example, with COVID-19, you're probably going to do things to try to get better faster. You're probably going to take medicine. You're probably going to rest a lot. You're probably going to start drinking lots of water. Um, all of these things help with any illness. Okay, rest. If you rest and you sleep a lot, sleep helps heal you. And taking a sugar pill doesn't do anything. But if you take it, you'll do all these other things. And so we're trying to isolate this variable of medication, then the medication help. So we're trying to eliminate the, the uh, cause of the placebo effect, but it'll always be there. <coughs> All right. Um, so this is a diagram representing each of these three things. We want cause and effect. So sometimes this word causation, causation, you'll see the word cause and effect, causation or causal. X causes Y. If X causes Y, one thing causes another, then we know there's a relationship between the two variables. Okay? Like smoking causes cancer. We don't need to do an experiment to determine that because we have collected data for many, many years and make that determination. Um, but if we're setting up an experiment, that's the goal, is try to say one thing causing another. Like this this medication helps you heal from COVID-19. Okay, There's a direct relationship. There weren't other things that affected you. Uh, if Z affects only Y, then that's called a lurking variable. If Z affects X and Y, then that's called a confounding variable. So the example that we did last week was uh, Methodist ministers uh, coming to, or ministers coming to the United States in the 1800s, and the amount of rum imported. The results were confounded because the third variable affected the number of ministers and the amount of rum imported, and that was the population. Population increases, therefore, both of those values increase. So that those results were confounded. So we say confounded results. If there's a lurking variable, that's where one variable affects your your third your third variable affects your outcome. Okay, of your study. Now you just gave an example of lurking variables in the previous slide.
Um, let me do this. So there's the definitions. You'll find all the definitions in the at the end of this section, I believe on page 252. So if you look at page 252, you'll find all these things. Um, the one thing you won't find is completely randomized design. The definition for completely randomized design means um, it's on page 238 for something to be completely randomized. I left that definition off. You randomly assign uh, subjects into different treatments. Okay, so random assignment means completely randomized. So I left that one off. Um, talked about all those things except for uh, blocking and match pairs. Uh, so I'll talk more about those later. So I'm not going to give you those definitions right now. But I was just referring to you to all the definitions that you're going to find in the book. So I would recommend um, this is not a, like a regular math class. It's more like a science class. So one of the things you want to do is maybe make three by five cards, understand each of these definitions and how they affect experiments and um, use those to study. There's a lot of reading in the book. Uh, if you read in the book, then uh, you're gonna be you're gonna be well prepared for a test. I try to draw a uh, design down here at the bottom. And in that design, um, I'm trying to use arrows like a flow chart. The first one you see is on page 238. So page 238 has the complete randomized design where they talk about uh, an experiment of 50 volunteers, 25 students go into an online group, 25 students go to the classroom, and then we look at SAT scores. So if you take an, SA, an online SAT class, we want to know does that help SAT scores. Well, one way to do it would be to say, okay, I'm going to put everybody into an SAT online class and help you with the SAT. Or an experiment would be take 25, put them into a class, 25 don't, and then compare their SAT scores. So there's a diagram representing a complete randomized design right there on page 238. There's another one on page 239. Take 60 houses, randomly assign people into 20 houses, in three groups, give them uh, different two different treatments and a control and then compare the how much electricity everybody's using so that's page 239 so I'd recommend to read that one uh, conserving energy so read about conserving energy on page 239 so the one word you're looking for whenever you're asked to um, make a or conduct an experiment the word completely randomized design and the word randomly assigned subjects to different groups is probably the most important thing that you'd have to say cell phones are driving okay so here's a poorly designed ex uh, experiment we're going to take 40 students 40 undergraduate students have them drive in a simulator equipped with hands-free cell phone and have them talk on the phone. All right, call, here, call your friend and have a conversation and you're going to drive. The car head breaks. How quickly does the student respond? So the student's um, reaction time is the response variable in the car. So again, this is a poorly designed experiment, but we have, we have subjects, we have treatments, we have factors. Um, so in this case, in this case, we would have uh, uh, one sample, one experiment. So in order to improve on the experiment, what we'd want to do is make a control and a treatment group. Have 20 people drive. They're just driving down the road, and then they break. 
because the car in front of them breaks. And then we have 20 people talking on the phone. Everybody pulls out their cell phone and they, they talk to it like, you know, they put it on speakerphone and talk to it like that. Um, is that distracting? So we not want to know is does distracted driving help reduce response time? And we're pretty sure it does. Um, that's why uh, the government passed some laws. You cannot talk on the phone while you drive because it's distracted driving. Oh, and there's other distracted driving um, you can get a ticket for having a dog on your lap. That's distracted driving. Uh, distracted. It's in the DMV handbook. Most of you guys are getting your driver's license soon. Read the handbook. Um, distracted driving is playing with the radio or eating or putting on makeup. All those things can get you a ticket from the police department for distracted driving. All right, so this is just understanding factors, treatments, subjects, and response variables. Repeated exposure to advertising. The answer may depend both on length of the ad and how often it is repeated. In the experiment, college students watched 30-minute television program. Uh, one group saw a 30-second commercial about a digital camera. The other group saw the same commercial in 90-second version. The same commercial was shown one, three, and five times during the program. After the program, all subjects answered questions about their recall of the ad, their attitude towards the camera, and their intention to purchase the camera. Um, I think this one is in the textbook. Yes. This is on page 235. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Okay, so there's two factors in this problem. There is the length of the commercial. And there is the amount of times commercial plays. So we have to know uh, what the factors are. So there's two factors. Um... You know, put up here factors. First factor is the commercial length. The second factor is the number of times commercial airs. So we have two factors, and the factors tell us what's happening with the treatments. So the uh, response variable is the recall of the ad. Their attitude towards um, purchasing the digital camera is the response variable. Um, there are six treatments in this problem. So you have a 30 second ad and you have a 60 or 90 second ad. So I'll write the treatments over here. I'm right. Treatments. So the first treatment is a 30 second ad and a one time. The commercial plays one time. The second treatment is a 30 second ad and the commercial plays three times. The third treatment is a 30 second ad and the commercial plays five times. So again, there's six treatments. We had 90 second ad. And there's a diagram of this on page 235. There's kind of boxes there. They have the factor A and factor B. So there's two factors. And then the number of times and how long the commercials play for. And that's part B. 
uh, part A is what are the explanatory and response variable. Uh, the subjects are um, all subjects viewed the 40 minute television program that included ads about the digital camera. So the subjects are the people involved. So that's just naming factors, treatments, and subjects and response variables in an experiment. So again, right there it says how to experiment bad, badly. Um, uh, if there's no treatment or control group, you only have one treatment applied, then you have a poor experiment. Okay. I had students do this um, do this project a few years ago. They had a weight gainer. So they were lifting weights and working out and doing all these workouts and they wanted to gain weight so they decided they were going to take weight gainer and they did an experiment. They took weight gainer for six weeks and determined that everyone gained an average of about three pounds. So did the weight gainer help them gain weight? Was it the weight gainer that helped them gain weight? Or was it some other factor? Were there lurking variables? Were they eating more protein? Um, uh, were the things they were doing to help them gain weight or was it just by chance they actually gain weight because body weight fluctuates depends on when you uh, was a scale not calibrated correctly um, so we know those digital scales that you have in your bathroom they don't always work properly um, students take online courses to score higher in the SAT we give selected students an online class and look at the SAT scores the problem is the students that take online classes are more motivated are likely to do better there's no random assignment to another group. So we don't have groups. We don't have groups. And that's why I came up with completely randomized design, page 238, where you have groups of, of people that go into different um, treatments. And the treatment is taken online class. So you have a treatment group, you have a control group. Uh, the Coke Pepsi challenge, um, that's tricky even though you're, get, you're getting two treatments when you taste coke and you taste pepsi and then you decide which one is better do you like coke or do you like pepsi so taste testing doesn't always work because uh, people already have notions of what they like and my example is that my mom drinks a ton of diet coke so if you ask her to taste diet coke or diet pepsi and which one do you like the most she's obviously going to pick diet coke because she drinks it all the time um, so she would say oh diet coke is better um, so we wouldn't really have uh, a good measurement of cause and effect, right? Did Pepsi cause you to like it more or did the Coke? So I, I talked previously about uh, principles of experimental design. It's on page 240. Or it's actually page 241. It starts on page 240. So proper design. Been spending a lot of time talking about randomization. So you want to randomly select people and randomly assign them. If you randomly select, and this was on the uh, last um, on on last week's assignment, if you randomly select, then we can apply results to the population. So we take a sample. We take a random sample of people. And then we can apply our results to the population. If we randomly assign to different groups, then we can establish cause and effect. So if you ever are reading a study, this is like if you are taking a quiz or a test or the AP test, and you ever see uh, 20 volunteers participated in an experiment, 10 went in the control group, 10 went in the treatment group. Well, they're volunteers, so we can't establish um, we can't establish these results for the entire population since they're volunteers. We can only say these this works cause and effect worked for the volunteers. It doesn't work for everybody. And that's why when you watch those commercials about these medications that come out and they got these crazy names, um, and they always post them on TV um, side effects include nausea, 
vomiting, and diarrhea, right? Those are always the side effects because it happened for a few people, it might happen to you. So um, if it happens for a few people, it's not going to happen to everybody. So we can't really apply the results to the entire population unless we randomly select people to take these medications. Um, someone did a study. My son has asthma, and um, he takes a medication for asthma. It's a daily uh, pill. And my wife saw a study. Somebody did a study that says that that medication causes anxiety. She's like, I don't want, I don't want my son to have anxiety. We should probably stop this or go on a different medication. I was like, well, he's five, you know. Um, well, and plus, it's a study of a small group of people. Plus, it's not an experiment. It's an observational study. Uh, some people that have taken the medication for long periods of time, and in adults. They probably get anxiety, but is it caused by the medication or are there other factors that go into it? Some people got anxiety, so that's not going to happen to everybody. Um, so again, random selection, random assignment. Uh, how would you select people to participate in a study listening to music to help students focus? Uh, maybe I would do this with my AP class and I would need to randomly pick students. I have 70 students. I'm going to randomly pick maybe 30 of them and say, hey, you're going to participate in my study. I randomly picked you. you got to give people incentives to participate, though. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you a gift card if you do this. Okay, I'm going to give you money. People want money. Uh, I'll give you a gift card to Starbucks. I used to give out gift cards to uh, Jack in the Box. I knew the manager at Jack in the Box, and they gave me, I had a stack of free, like, milkshakes. And so I was like, who wants a free milkshake? I was giving out, I was like Oprah, giving out free milkshakes to everybody um, in my classes. It was pretty cool. Uh, how would you assign? Okay, so assigning people to different groups, you can flip a coin. If you just have a tre treatment group and control group, you have two things. Flip a coin. Tells you're going to treatment. Heads, you're going to control group. Okay, uh, you're going to assign digits to everybody. Use the table of random digits to assign. And yet, so you'll see questions like that uh, in the homework. It'll say to randomly assign 10 people to the control and 10 people to the treatment group. You would need to use the table of random digits. Draw a diagram of weight loss experiment that would use, that would block by gender. Okay, so uh, a diagram. So I got a diagrams, page 238, 239, are diagrams that represent this. I drew a diagram at the bottom. So blocking by gender. So I'll go through um, how to block. Okay, why would you use blocks? Because different people uh, react differently to uh, treatments. So let me clear these. So I'm going to block by gender. I would I would say I'm going to have um, males and females, and then I'm going to give a control and a treatment group to each one. So a blocking. Um, so I would take male. So let's say. Um, 100 males, they're going to go into uh, a treatment and control, 100 females, because males and females lose weight at different rates, and then I'm going to take um, those and put them into a control group, and put them into a treatment group. Jeez, wait. Spell weight. Okay, there we go. All right. So we we have our 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 two two groups of males and females. This is called blocking by 
gender. So I'm going to block by gender. What if I want to block by different categories? What if I block by age? Because people of different ages react differently to uh, losing weight. So I would say everybody under 50, under 50 and anyone over 50. I have the under 50 group and the over 50 group. And I'm going to put them into a treatment group and control group. And then measure the results of the under 50 group. Measure the results of the over 50 group. See, compare them to each other. And there's a picture of this on page uh, 247. Blocking in a randomized design. Page 247. 247. So using the randomized block design for... Um, what are they doing here? Doing the laundry. Should you wash your clothes in cold water or hot water? Does hot water really get your clothes cleaner? Um, so this is uh, an example of blocking by light colored clothes and dark co colored clothes. So that's your block. Um, if you're going to do an experiment on dogs, you would want to block by probably large dogs, small dog, and medium sized dog because different dog breeds react differently to different medications or even different dog foods. Okay, so you have different ways to block. You block people. Um, you can block people by, uh, like I did, age or gender. You can block people by, uh, like if you're doing a study on how long people drive to work. Okay, um, or their travel times, stuff like that. You can block by um, type of car that they drive. Does the car that they drive determine how long it takes them to get to work? Like right? some people drive faster, whatever. So that's blocking. And blocking is uh, an improvement on a completely randomized design. So you can have, it's still completely randomized. We're still going to randomly assign people to the control and treatment group. So it's still completely randomized, but a block is an improvement on a regular experiment. Placebo effect. So this was study was done. Um, it was not really a good experiment. Um, gastric freezing, people have ulcers in their intestines. Uh, just like people get kidney stones. Oh, by the way, you should be drinking lots of water so you don't get kidney stones. Kidney stones are extremely painful from what I understand. I've never had a kidney stone, but everybody, I know people that have. Um, ulcers, kidney stones, gallstones, they all require surgery. Um, a balloon was inserted in the intestine and refrigerated liquid was pumped through the balloon. The idea of cooling the stomach will reduce the production of acid and relieve pain. The experiment was reported in the American Journal of Medication and showed that gastric freezing did in fact reduce ulcer pain. The treatment was safe and easy and used for several years. Okay, so is this an experiment? Okay, we only had one treatment that we applied to one group of people. So we have nothing to compare it to. So this was a poor experiment because we can't do a comparative study. Comparative studies allow us to look at the statistics from wherever we, we gather. And uh, in this case, what percent of people improved or felt better. So we give them a pain scale rating. How much is your pain? Um, if the average pain level is 8 and now it's a 6, before and after, that's another way we can measure pain uh if the uh, experiment actually works. So in order to do a better experiment, a later experiment divided the ulcer patients into two groups. One group was treated with gastric freezing. The other received a placebo. The placebo was body temperature liquid. The results, 34% of the patients in the treatment group improved and 38% of adults in the placebo group improved. So if you got a placebo, they had 
higher rate of improvement. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. So did the experiment work? Uh, the experiment worked, but we could not establish cause and effect. Uh, the experiment used the placebo effect. People thought they were getting better. So people heal over time. People do things to feel better. People get more rest if they participate in experiments. People trust doctors. They think that gastric freezing works. Um, well, it does. It works for everybody, even if they pump body temperature liquid through your um, intestine. It works. So that's an example of the placebo effect. So at the end, I had those two numbers, 38% and 34%. What is the difference? Okay, not much. Okay, if there's not much of a difference between your results, then your results are not statistically significant. If there's a big difference in your results, for example, 50% in the placebo group and 80% in the treatment group improve. Well, 80% is much bigger than the 50% that improve. Therefore, we would know that gastric freezing would work. Okay. So the observed effect is so large that it would, would not occur by chance. So there could be chance variation from one sample to the next sample. Um, so we want to eliminate things happening by chance. So randomly selecting people, uh, if, if we randomly select people, then we apply the results to the entire population. If we randomly assign, we can conclude cause and effect. So I mentioned that previously as well. So match pairs, double blind, and blocking. This is these are all improvements on an experiment. So if I invent the smart pill, which I invented um, a couple years ago, they're called smarties, and I call them smart pills. Um, <laughs> given a smart pill, create a diagram of an experiment. So in a smart pill, we would want to um, have control and treatment group, and probably a placebo group. So we would have three groups. And then I'm going to give everybody a smart pill. And then I'm going to look at the outcomes. So if you do blocking, uh, blocking by gender is usually the best because people react differently. Um, males and females react differently to different treatments. If, uh, if you have a matched pairs experiment, we're going to pair you up by similarities. Um, so if I'm doing the smart pill experiment, I would want to take people or students they probably have the same GPAs, are in the same grade, same age, and have have all those similarities, and then I'm going to put you into different groups. So that's matched pairs, where you take people and you put them into different groups randomly, but you pair them up first, and then you look at their results at the end. Um, and we have mathematical ways to do comparisons, and we'll study this later on in statistics how to compare this, the numbers af after the experiment. So if we do this in a match pairs experiment, it's ca usually called a, a paired t-test. Uh, if we do a match pairs experiment. Um, if we do double blind, all double blind means, it sounds complicated, but it means that your subjects are blind. Not like physically blind, okay, but they are, they are blind to what group they are going into. So they don't know if they're getting a placebo pill or if they're getting the actual pill. So you're not going to tell them. And then double blind means that the experimenter doesn't know if you got the placebo pill or the smart pill. So both groups do not know what you get. So a doctor that does a study, for example, COVID-19, Dr. Anthony Fauci from the Center of Disease Control, the CDC, he doesn't know um, who's going into what group when they're studying medications for COVID-19. The people doing the work, the groundwork, is um, the doctors and the nurses that are in hospitals. Um, he just looks at the data after the fact, so he doesn't know which group is going to where. You just look at data and and he's often said that well we have to look at the data we got to look at the data and see what the data says
Um, there's two types of matched pairs experiments. Um, in a matched pairs design, you're going to pair people up by similarities and then put them into two different groups. Okay, that's one method of matched pairs. Um, or there's a, it's called a paired design. So comparative studies are best. So um, in a paired design, you, one person, you do two different things. So if you're doing a taste test, you're going to taste two different things, right? Instead of uh, pairing people up and then having them taste one and having one person taste the other. Oh, I like this one. Oh, I, I like that one. Okay. Um, you get to do two different things. So like in, uh, in a study, the smart pill study, you would take the smart pill and um, do some kind of test right and see if it works and then you would take uh, a placebo and see if it worked maybe at a later time maybe six eight months later you would take a placebo pill see if it helped you focus on study um, and then compare the results how did you do um, so that's the, that would be a paired design so again two different methods of doing a match pairs design and that's on page 249 where match pairs begins they talk about sitting and standing and pulse rate. Uh, there's an example there that spiraled uh, through there. All right, so in uh, the study, listening to music and does it help productivity? I think in the book they say, does it limit productivity? <laughs> they say, uh, I get a lot of students that say, why well, listen to music? It helps me focus. And when I study and you know teachers think the opposite um, but we want to know does it work so in a match pairs I would group people by similarities and give them uh, both treatments they would listen to music and they would listen without music or listen without music they would study without music and then determine did the music actually help or hurt their their scores or their focus okay I'm using a cell phone while driving. A matched pairs design would allow the same student to use a cell phone and not use a cell phone. So you could do two different things. So um, that's a paired design where I could have you drive and talk on the cell phone and see how focused you are and then drive and not use a cell phone and see how focused you are. Study was done in uh, Ohio State University. They're like the number one party school in the USA. So a lot of people want to go there. Um, it's a big school down on the uh, Midwest, and they did a study there. Um, it was uh, they had people drink alcohol and drive a road course, and then they had people stay up all night and drive a road course. And there were ten people in uh, in each sample, and the people that drove the road course that were tired did worse than the people that were that were drunk. Okay, so that was kind of interesting study. Um, so they did it like that. They did one experiment where you had 10 in the getting the treatment they were drinking. 10 got the treatment of staying up all night and then trying to drive. And they, they showed that it, the sleepy group was worse drivers. Then they did a, a paired experiment where they took 10 people and those 10 people did both. Okay, they got drunk and drove the road course. And then at a later date, they had them stay up all night and drive the road course. And they found the same same results. Okay, so they knew it wasn't random chance. This is from the AP 2001 test. The students uh, are asked to design an experiment to compare the productivity of two varieties of dwarf fruit trees. The site for the experiment is a field that bordered by a densely forested area. So I drew trees right there. Um, so you got a forest and you got a field. Does the forest affect the growth of the fruit trees? So we got blocks here. We got block A and block B. Which one is better? Which blocking scheme is better for the experiment? So uh, you have to use words, um, statistical language, in order to 
make the best statement about the randomized block design. So within each block, the researchers need to randomly assign. So you need to use the words, as long as the trees are randomly assigned um, to each group, um, what effect do they have? So block scheme A or block scheme B, what I want you to do is um, go to the AP Central website and study up on this to get your results. And I'll post a video about that. Um, so I'll include the chapter three test and a video about this problem. So what I want you to do is think about what blocking scheme is better. Is it A or B? And then why do you have to randomly assign? What's the purpose of random assignment? Okay. Random assignment means we can conclude cause and effect. Did the forest cause trees to grow small or grow, grow bigger? Um, and explain what the purpose of randomization is in context of the experiment. So whenever it says in context, in context of an experiment, you're going to just parrot the question. Oh, the dwarf fruit trees um, next to the forested area tend to grow smaller because they're in the shade more often, or something like that. Okay, so that's an example of an AP question that you might see. Um, later on, that second semester, we'll do, um, we just got to notice that students are going to be back in the classroom next semester on the schedule. Uh, they're going to have to be testing all of the teachers. I don't know how they're going to test 3,000 students. <laughs> it's going to be difficult, but we're supposed to be back in the classroom. And if you were in the classroom, we would be doing a lot of AP practice, and I call it AP practice. And I usually give a grade on AP practice. Um, we don't have time for AP practice problems, so that's the first one that I've shown. Um, so I hope that you can go to the AP Central website on the announcements page in Canvas. Um, so if you go on the Canvas, go to the announcements page. I guess I can show where that's at. So let me stop my share. So if you go on to announcements, and so there's some videos on there. Sign up for the AP test right there. Here's AP Central practice questions. Click on there. This takes you to the AP College Board, apcentral.com. And that's where you would sign up to take the AP test anyways. Um, so in here you have navigations to get to the, the released exam questions. So here's the 2018 exam. That was a 2001 free response question. Um, I don't remember what problem that was. So look at all questions. And then you can look at the answers on there as well. So like I said, there's a formula sheet on there. All the formulas are given to us on the AP test. Here it is. Question number four. So blocking. So then you can go to sample response for question four or look at scoring guidelines. So how are they going to score the test? So you can look at the, um, the res results of all the questions. There's question two, question three. Uh, question four, the solution is pretty short. Blocking scheme A is the best because they use the word homogeneous blocks. Um, so block by a scheme a randomization reduce possible bias due to confounding variables such as fertility moisture or productivity okay so that's the blocking question on the AP tests so if we have a chance to go look at there's all kinds of release test questions on there get a chance get some free time Go on there uh, when you're not in class, like on Thursdays or on Wednesdays or on Mondays when you're not in class. Go ahead and take a look at this website.
All right, any questions?